This is very long. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's long because, uh, hang on, because things like this happened to me. This came in my inbox this morning. The, F the Financial Times has announced an entire series on artificial intelligence and, in, and its impact on the workplace. And I said, guys, come on, you could have done this last week. So <laughs> everything I've, I'm about to say is going to be contradicted by what the uh, Financial Times is saying. This is the way I'm going to deal with it. The reason I'm doing this is because a lot of you guys were sending me articles saying, oh my goodness, did you see this in the Atlantic about robots destroying work and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I, rather than answer you all individually, I thought I'd better stand up and try to answer you collectively. This is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to break it down into two pieces, and they're fairly chunky. Automation of work, which is the, the robots side of things, and, the, uh, and the, the impact on manufacturing in particular, because don't forget the last election, there was, everything was about manufacturing. Then what I call the organization of work, which I think is a far bigger deal, than, than automation, uh, and it is very related to automation and robots and so forth, couldn't exist without it, but it is the thing that is driving the change in the workplace, and it's the workplace. The loss of traditional jobs is what that bit's about. Then over on the other side, I'm, I'm going to talk, right at the end, I'll talk about rising inequality in economic insecurity. This thing called the contingent workforce, the gig economy, you're reading all about that. That is this organization of work piece coming to, to life. Then I put in right bright red, just so you all notice it, the increasing social unrest. Uh, even brighter red at the bottom, so you really do see it. Uh, everything we're going through is unique. None of us have been through this. None of us. This is a very, very strange time in the economy. There is going to be a great deal of turbulence. There's going to be a great deal of unrest. And I think we're going to have to think in terms of reconstructing society uh, in order to accommodate the uh, digital age or whatever buzzword you want to apply to it. So let's just get, for the sake of speed, let's get on. Let's be clear what we mean by automation. The substitution of capital for labor, that's pretty clear. And it's an ongoing process. We've been doing this for 200 years, 300 years. There's nothing new about it, all right? But that is essentially what we're talking about. I'd like to give you a couple of quotes. My favorite guy, Keynes. This is an incomprehensible thing. Try reading it. I'm going to try reading it to you now. Let's, listen, we are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name. Please, write in English. But of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. All right? This is where the phrase technological unemployment comes from. Then he goes on in classic e economic speak. This means unemployment to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. My goodness, what a mouthful, right? No wonder, no wonder people's heads, you know, eyes glaze over when economists talk to speak. What he's saying is that because when we fire people, because we automate in order to increase productivity, some of those people might not find jobs. That's what he's saying. And we call that thing technological unemployment. This, by the way, was in a note he wrote to his grandchildren, our grandchildren, in which he predicted great wealth, great prosperity, and potentially the end of work, all right? Which was a good thing to Keynes because it meant we could all go around and indulge in leisure as opposed to suffering through the hard labor of work. Notice the date, too, 1930. He was wrong. Let me move on. Another one of my favorites, Leontief. He, I've got two from him just to show you how wrong you can really be. He, now, he's, he's far more abrupt. Labor will become less and less important. More and more workers will be replaced by machines. I do not see new industries that can employ everybody who wants a job. 1952. Clearly, lots of new jobs were found. He was wrong. Okay, but we've been worrying for a while. I'll give him a second bite of the cherry. Here we go. 
this is even more depressing at the end. Any worker who now performs his task by following specific instructions can, in principle, be replaced by a machine. This means that the role of humans as the most important factor of production is bound to diminish. In the same way, this is the bit where it gets really grim. In the same way that the role of horses in agricultural production was first diminished and then eliminated by the introduction of tractors. 1983, wrong again. We've been worrying about <laughs> automation and the rise of machines for a very long time. And each time, I mean, these are, these are not silly people. These are, these are intelligent, well-informed people. And they're basically saying, oh my goodness, there's a problem. But every time we turn around, somehow stuff happens and people are employed. It reminds me of uh, the movie. The movie, I, I know I've mentioned this anecdote to some of you before. Uh, the movie Shakespeare in Love, do you remember? You remember in there? The guy who owns the theater, he's forever the debt collector, is forever knocking on the door, and he always manages at the last minute to pay. Somebody asks him, how do you manage it? And he says, I don't know, it's a miracle. That's, that seems to be the economics profession to the, the problem of automation. I don't know, it's a miracle. Don't worry about it. Move on. However, we should worry about it. Just thought I'd let you know where all the robots are. If you get a rush of blood and want to be a latter-day Luddite, you have to go to South Korea. Don't worry about it. South, these, this is the number of robots per 10,000 work, workers in manufacturing. The bar closest to me is South Korea, by far, far and above, that's 530-odd. There's no real surprises in this list, I don't think. If you go across, you'll find the United States in that middle bit, okay? And then you find the UK on the far, on the far side there, doing its best to bring up the rear. One name you won't see here is China. Why is that? Well, remember what Keynes says, economizing on labor. They've got a vast army of cheap labor. They don't need machines. Not yet, okay? Not yet. Soon. Coming soon. Third point down. Over 40% of the robots being installed are in China. They aim to have 150 per 10,000 by 2025, and that would move them roughly to the middle of that last chart. Okay? Why are they doing that? Because Chinese workers are now demanding more pay. <laughs> it's now becoming sensible to replace them by robots. <laughs> so so we, the process that we're complaining about in the past tense, they're now going to be complaining about in manufacturing in the current and future tense. Just thought I'd mention the major automated industries are the ones, no surprise to any of this, to any of you. Automotive, electronics, metalworking. All right. So that's kind of where the robots are. What are they doing to us? Well, by the way, top, top here, Azamolu, not Asamoglu. He gets it. He's a very nice guy, and every time anyone says Asamoglu, he kind of his eyes glaze over. Our pronunciation of Turkish last names is not very good. And Restrepo, that's easy. They've written two papers. You can see this is a whole press, guys. 2016, 2017. Then David Artur and Anna Salomons in 2017. There's a disagreement between the two. That's why I've got them both here. The first one. This is Asimoglu and Mesolulu uh, and Restrepo. Each new robot reduces employment by about six jobs in the area in which the robot is installed. So let's say, let's pick on Youngstown, Ohio. In Youngstown, you'd lose six jobs for every robot. Wages would go down by about 0.7%. This is in the 2017 of their papers. The 2016 of their papers said there was no effect. This is a net effect. Go across the other side. These, these negatives in Youngstown, Ohio, in our example, are offset by gains elsewhere in the, in, in the, in the economy. So in Vermont, we pick up an extra job. Why? Because we're all saving money on the stuff in this factory. Productivity in Youngstown has gone up, fewer workers. Price of the product they're producing tends to go down. That means we all have a smidgen of extra cash. We spend that extra cash, that generates a new job somewhere other than in Youngstown. Okay? 
which is why, which is why the improvements from automation very often are spread across the entire economy, but the bad side of it, the downside of it, is very, very concentrated. Think Rust Belt, think 2016 elections, and so forth. All right? Now, the gain, according to these guys, was three jobs. And the gain in wages was 0.45%. So you can see in their 2017 paper, there's a net negative even when you take these benefits into account. Autour, he sits down the corridor in MIT. He says, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm going to do a study too. His study says the, the spillover effects, these positive effects, exactly offset the negative effects. So you've got a total disagreement, all right? Uh, there's a, all I can tell you is that, I can't re be too reassuring, that the, profe the economics profession has, I'm, I was trying I was, I was to choose my words carefully at this point. I think there's a disagreement that is ongoing. I think the history, as I said earlier, is reassuring. Over the long term, we tend to f absorb all these lost these, these displaced workers. In the short term, there's a lot of chaos. So it depends on your perspective. If you're happy and you're not in Youngstown and you're willing to wait a few decades, great. If you're in Youngstown and you're worried about paying your rent, not so great, okay? That is the state of play on the impact of robots from an academic point of view. I've got a couple more charts to show you. This is this. I'm sorry about the gobbledygook on the bottom. Job losses are in manufacturing. I'm keeping on manufacturing at this point because it was and is such a topic. Uh, I think the bigger issue is going to be in services, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. The, 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 is it still this argument I've just pointed out? Hicks from, I think it's Ball State, written two papers, and he's done a very, what he's done is a very interesting little study that I want to describe to you. He took 20, 2000 and 2010. And he said, here's the production we've got in 2010. How many jobs would that have been if we had the productivity as it was in 2000? All right? So he said, there would have been a lot more jobs because productivity has improved. We've got rid of people, right? And he calculated that about 90% of all the job losses in manufacturing are due to that productivity effect. There is a little bit of trade effect down there. That's the green bit. And that tiny little <laughs> bit at the bottom is actually the gain from extra demand in that 10 years. Now, for all of you who are kind of worried about um, sustainable economics and growth being a problem long term, this should actually be quite reassuring because it's telling us that we can get pretty decent economic growth without having to use a great deal of extra manufacturing. The, the growth is coming more in services than manufacturing, which means that the carbon footprint is going down. That's an aside. It's not something I want to worry about today. Here, the reason I put this up, this is the same study, 2000 versus 2010. I want to draw your attention to this big, huge bar here. That's the gain in productivity in computers and electronics. So the biggest loss of jobs in manufacturing happens to be in the very sector that's producing the machinery <laughs> that increases productivity. It's just one of those great ironies. That when you look at it, all the rest, it's, I don't think there's an industry sector right all across the page that hasn't had some kind of, some kind of loss. Don't strain your necks, guys. It's not going to help you. Okay? <laughs> just take it from me. There's a lot of job losses. All right? But manufacturing's always had that. Manufacturing's had job losses since manufacturing was invented. This is not a new phenomenon. As I, those quotes from Keynes and Leontief uh, indicated, this is not a new thing. What is new is this. This is the bit where it gets a little complicated. Third point down. Computers are what, in the marvelous jargon of economic historians, a general purpose technology, all right? The prior two best examples are steam and electricity. 
First industrial revolution was steam. Second industrial revolution, for those that you were unaware of the fact we did have two. All right, there's two. The other one was, the second one was electricity. This is the third, and it's the computer driving this third uh, 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 revolution. And as a, as a consequence, when you, get a, a, when you get a general purpose technology, it takes decades for it to hit its stride. Steam took about 80 years from invention to really, really showing up in society, reorganizing society, the first factory showing up. Don't forget, steam was invented to pump water out of mines. The steam engine was in, invented to pump water out of mines, not to drive power and certainly not for locomotives on tracks. They, bright spark, somebody said, hey, this is a useful general purpose technology. I can, I can do all sorts of stuff with it. And that's when the impact of steam really took off. About, about eight decades later, electricity, same thing. Electricity, the science of it, the harnessing of it, was available in the late 1800s, but it really didn't hit its stride till about the 1920s. That's when it had its biggest industrial societal impact. Electric electricity into the home, en masse. Electrification of factories, en masse. All right? Now I want to point out that we are somewhere in that seven, eight decade piece with the computer. It's been around a long time. If you, I mean, it depends how you define the beginning of it. Second World War was really when modern computing took off. It's been refined and refined and refined, but it hasn't found its way in deeply into the economy yet in the way that I suspect it's going to. And the way it's going to is artificial intelligence. That is where this general purpose technology is going to have its biggest impact. All right? Back to the top. Manufacturing is just the beginning. The biggest part of our economy is the service sector. That is where artificial intelligence is going to do the, have its greatest impact. By far. By far. This study from Oxford University, 2013, I don't know why it was done in 2013, and all of a sudden this year there's all sorts of articles quoting it. I don't know why there was that kind of a lag. Look across there. These are, these are the kind of industries where artificial intelligence, according to this study, is going to have an impact. 80% of jobs in the food, uh, in the hotel business. 80%. Or that list, 40% in aggregate. The Oxford University study said approximately 40% of all American jobs are subject to being replaced because of artificial intelligence. All right? I just list these industry sectors over there so you can see them. I mean, it's, some of those industries are going to be devastated, totally wiped out from a job-creating perspective. So if I was going to summarize this little part of the presentation, or manufacturing has gone through this a lot, and we're used to it. So it's services where the big damage, damage is going to be. And I think it's artificial intelligence that is, that is causing the angst. Because think about the service industries that, that are going to be top of the list. They're skilled, we call them professions. <laughs> Doctors, accountants, lawyers. Their skills are going to plummet in value plummet in value, all right? You're going to need far fewer. The ones that remain will be paid a lot more, but there's going to be a need for far fewer. That is where artificial intelligence is going to start working its way into the community. Back, because I need to deal with this, back to manufacturing. I just thought you should see this. <clears throat> it's not an unreal or imagined thing that manufacturing employment dropped off a cliff. It did, <laughs> all right? <clears throat> and it did somewhere around 2000, 2001. That's when it really came down. It, it, the, the, it bottomed out at the bottom of the great crash and then started to tick back up slightly ever since. But it, it, you can see it kind of plateaued along there in the middle of the years and then it just came back. It's never coming back, never coming back. This is the United States. This is US, sorry. Yeah, that's United States employment. 
put it in context. These are the percentages of total jobs in the economy. This is manufacturing's decline, it's the black line. Is being, it, manufacturing has been declining as, as an employer in this country since World War II. Just this being, look at agriculture. Agriculture is a triumph of productivity. Triumph of productivity. I think you're going to see manufacturing down in the same space by the time, by the time automation has worked its way through. We, we feed this country with about 3% of our workforce in agriculture. 3%. Now think back 150 years, it was 80, 80%. All right? <laughs> That's a radical change. Move the manufacturing bar forward. I think we'll be making all the stuff we need to make with about 5% of the population in manufacturing. All right? This, that trend is irreversible. It's there. And you look, so we'll be left with services and government. <laughs> all right, guys? And for those of you of a, a critical nature, you'll notice that the percentage in government has been a fairly constant constant number. The number has obviously gone up, but as a percentage of the population, it's pretty much where it has been for a long time. Services are where the action is, and as I said a few minutes ago, services are where the action of artificial intelligence is going to be. So all of this angst is not new. And I, I came up with this little tire, th this for you, just, uh, just to make you feel comfortable. Late 16th century, Queen Elizabeth I says no to a patent application because it's going to put young ladies out of work. Can't do it. Sorry, guys, these machines, no. I need the young ladies of England working at sewing. Move forward. I think most of you have heard of eight, the, the Luddites, 1811 through 1816. It was an outright rebellion. There were m mobs roaming around the countryside, breaking in and smashing machines, led by the legendary Ned Ludd, hence the name. And it was an inappropriate time to do it because this is right at the time when Britain was fighting France and the Napoleonic Wars. It's a little embarrassing to have your manufacturing disrupted that way. Move forward again. A, uh, the, 18, 8, 1860, we've got the shovelers in the docks forming a union to, to, to protest grain elevators. Why? Because the grain elevators replace shovelers. There you go. Move forward again. This is a favorite of mine. The Red Flag Act. These horrible automated things called automobiles are flying around the country at five miles an hour. That's dangerous. So we pass a law saying that you've got to walk in front with a red flag to warn people. <laughs> kind of takes the fun out of your Maserati. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 1922, Fosdick, there's a lecture in, at Wellesley in which he says, this can't go on. The pace of change is so radical, society's going to collapse. Not so much. All right. 1930, Keynes. 19, 1950, we have Ford and the apocryphal moment when he, he's automated his factory. And he walks the head of the union, I think I've told you this, he walks the head of the union through the sh shop floor, right? And he says, God, you know, ha, ha, ha. Ford's thinking he's smart. Looks at the, all, the, all the new machines and says, uh, you, Mr. Head of Union, how are you going to get your union dues from these machines? Ha, ha, ha. Well, God bless the union head. He said, ah, Henry, how are you going to sell them your cars? You know, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Automation works as long as there's demand. <laughs> it doesn't work so well if there's no demand. 1960, President Johnson sets up a committee to worry about this horrible thing called automation and economic progress. 1960. Then we have 1995. Jeremy Rifkin writes this book, ominously, The End of Work. He's made a 20-something year career out of that one. I'm, I feel really jealous. I should have done it myself. And then at the end, I put the Oxford study just to remind you that these radical statements and these forecasts are still hanging around and they've all been wrong so far so far so let me just summarize the first part automation fears are old hat job displacement is a very real issue it's it's a short-term issue you've spent 
your whole life becoming really good at doing something. You get fired at age 50, and then there's some idiot writing an article in Atlantic Monthly that it's because you're not skilled. America is lacking skilled workers. And you're looking there saying, heck, I got 30 years of skill. What do you mean I'm not skilled? All right? Not only is your skill irrelevant for the future, which doesn't make you feel too good, chances are that you're not going to re-educate yourself. So all of those articles about, well, we need to re-educate people, it's just nonsense. You're not going to turn a whole bunch of factory workers, coal miners and so on, into computer programmers. It's not going to happen. You need a different solution. And it doesn't sound too good to the ear of someone who's just been fired saying, A, you're, you're badly skilled, B, you're uneducated. This doesn't sit well. However, if you want to take the long-term perspective, history is reassuring. <laughs> yeah, we've gone through this. The reason we're standing here today in the lap of luxury, and yes, we're in the lap of luxury, is because of 200, 250 years of relentless, relentless firing of workers and replacing them by machines. The capitalist engine, in its rawest, red-blooded way, has produced an enormous amount of wealth. And society has found ways, not always easily found ways, I might add, but it's found ways of sharing that wealth. So the people who get displaced don't mind necessarily being displaced. Disruption, however, is disrupting. And if you're in the middle of it, as we are, you can expect trouble, social and political trouble. If, big if, you're not sharing that wealth properly, and if society, especially our politicians, seem to be completely oblivious to what is going on. And I think, in truth, that's our issue. You go back to the last election. Nobody, nobody had an answer to this. Nobody. They didn't even attempt to talk about it. Instead, we were promised bringing jobs back. No, no. What we need to talk about is the future, not the past. All right, but... There's a couple of conundrums. This is productivity increase, and it's kind of not very good. If, that all, if we're doing all this displacement, why, why isn't productivity soaring? <laughs> it should be, right? It should be. And this is a quote from Sol. Solo is the uh, godfather of growth theory in, in economics. Every, every major growth model has Solo's name attached to it in some way. And this is back in 1987. The 80s were the, the prime, last prime period of angst about productivity. I remember people like Stephen Roach at J.P. Morgan Chase made an entire career out of writing papers about why computers aren't changing productivity the way they should be. Solo said computers are everywhere except in productivity. Well, you remember what I said, they're a general purpose technology. It takes society a long time to figure out how to use them properly. And 87 was way, way too early. I wouldn't mind betting that we're way, way too early still. Then there's this thing at the bottom I want to point out to you, because I think it's really, really important. Baumol's disease. Poor old Professor Baumol. He's best known for disease. It's not good. His point was that if you are displacing workers from a, uh, uh, an industry that now becomes highly productive, they, the tendency is for them to go and get reemployed in a sector of the economy that is less productive. They go from, let's say, making cars to working in the healthcare industry, which is one of our least productive industries, right? So the average, social average, looks like we're not gaining much productivity at all. Some sectors are booming along, but others are really, really lagging. And the, if you remember that slide I said, I showed you with services being the predominant part of the economy, services by and large are woefully unproductive, low productivity, by and large. We've squeezed agriculture to the minimum. We're in the process of squeezing manufacturing to the minimum. The next target for productivity increase is the service industry. When we do that, we'll, get, we'll, we'll regain productivity. Conundrum number two. If productivity is going up, why aren't wages going up? Because rising productivity is the source of the wealth from which wages are paid. 
I'll leave it at that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Why aren't they? They flattened out well before the digital era ever hit. Something else was going on. There's another look at them. I, I, this, is, this is the one chart. Hillary Clinton put this chart up during the last election, and then for some reason they ever tried to talk about it. It's kind of really weird, because it seems to me really kind of a socially important chart. If, if you take this line back in time, wages and productivity have gone pretty closely together. Something happened to divide them back in the late 70s, early 80s. All right. I'm sorry I'm going through this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of it to go through. I'm not, forget that. That's my favorite chart. I invented that chart to explain this to myself, so don't worry about that. Reduce it to this. When you're going through this kind of radical change, and don't forget the country's only, the Western world has only gone through this maybe twice in mo modernity. I, I guess the Stone Age, you know, Iron Age, Bronze Age, Bronze Age, whatever, they count too, but we've gone through it in modernity twice, steam and electricity. We're going through number three. And each of those other times, everything down here had to change. Everything has to change. You can't tinker with society to make this work. We have to change our cultural norms. We go from, you know, what we used to do to doing this, <laughs> right? Everybody says, oh, it's terrible. No, it's the new way of doing things. It's not terrible. It's the way we're going to do things from now on. Regulation. We've got regulations that are great for an industrial era. They suck for a digital era. I mean, I'll give, I'm going to give you an example in a minute. They really do. The government is, as it has to be, it's a lag. It's way behind where industry is. Industry is changing things. Government is trying to catch up. Institutions. The biggest institution that's going to change is the thing called the job. That is an institution. It's an artifact of industrialization. It will not exist in the digital era. There will be no jobs, OK? Not in the way we know them. There will be jobs in a different way. Physical structure. Think of, think of what happened when the automobile came along. All of a sudden, there are roads everywhere. Everyone leaves the city and goes out to the suburbs. Now it's the exact opposite happening. Everybody's leaving the suburbs and the country and going into the cities. Why? Because there's huge benefits from being around other people doing this. And the country doesn't have a good network for you to do this. So there you go. Networks, education. Talk about a. <laughs> The edu American education system blossomed early in industrialization because we needed a whole bunch of people to go off and do stuff. We've now got about somewhere in a, a graduation from high school in the high 80%, somewhere in the 40% range from college. The incremental effort to get from 85 to 90 high school graduation or from 40, let's say, to 50 in college education it's astonishing. It's going to be practically impossible. Why? Because that may, the, the assumption is you've got a pool of people capable of going to college who want to go to college who would benefit from going to college. By the way, the United States is not an outlier in any of that. Even the, even the most advanced education systems in the world are struggling to get above 40% college graduation, struggling to get above 80% high school uh, graduation. This is not a unique American problem. <clears throat> technology will leave. All of this needs to be rebalanced if we're going to suck out the productivity from the digital era. Which brings me to this, part two. <sighs> the organization of work has to change. It is changing. Business is changing it. Whether we like it or not, the gig economy, whatever fancy word you want to use to describe it, is here and it's here to stay, and that's what this next bit's about. This is a job, as we kind of know it in the traditional sense. You get a wage, but you get a whole ton of other stuff. You get a retirement benefit. You get a, a, a health benefit. You get, if you're lucky, paid time off. You've got experience and training because you've got a reliable employer, and you, you, know, you can be pushed through the ranks. And don't forget, You've got accounting and legal support. People forget that bit. The, the Human Resources Department is filing your taxes every couple of weeks. You don't have to do that. If you've got a W-2, you're not worried about, am I ahead or behind on my income taxes? Until you file at the end of the year. 
because you've got somebody doing it in the infrastructure. There's accounting support. So a job is not just the wage, it's a whole bunch of other services that come with it. And getting those services was a hard, long, political fight. It was difficult. It took about two or three generations before paid time off started appearing, right? It took a long struggle to get here. And I don't see why anyone in this room would think it's not going to be a similar struggle going forward to, re to recapture this. There's going to be political problems. There's going to be social problems. But remember, a job as we know it, the traditional job, with this package is a function of industrialization. It did not exist before the industri industrialization. In fact, the word job was a bad word, as in a, do a bank job. You know, the word job was a pejorative. <laughs> you have a job, ugh, you must be, you know, robbing someone, okay? It changed through time to this dignified thing that we're all terrified of losing. The contingent workforce. I put these two pie charts here so you can kind of get the idea. This one is the government data, that's McKinsey. McKinsey numbers are probably more reliable. McKinsey estimates that, and there's a real reason for that, because the government simply doesn't collect it. Why? Because they're living in the industrial age, not the digital age. They don't need to collect it in their heads. It was only, a uh, side story, somebody said don't mention Trump. I will. The money was put into the budget to collect the, for the BLS to collect this data this year, and it peril, came perilously close to getting axed. But they kept it. And they did a study, and they're now going to be doing a contingent workforce study on a regular basis. They finished the survey, but the numbers aren't out. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, this, watch this space. McKinsey says somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of our workforce is in the gig economy already. They, in other words, they are earning a living not from a traditional job. They don't have an employer, which means, which I'll show you in a minute, they don't have all that other stuff that comes with a job. They are incredibly financially insecure people, all right? Now, the government data shows, only breaks it down into self-employed and temporarily employed. This is, think this through. From the government's perspective, if you're a self-employed gig worker, and you don't have a gig next month, you're not unemployed. You're self-employed. Still, you can't collect unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance, the way we know it, is an institution of the industrial era. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything has to change. Katz and Kruger in 2016 did their level best with the uh, government numbers. And they, what they came up with, the, the real reason for showing you this is because what they came up with. Between 20, 2005 and tw 2015, there was a net increase of 9 million jobs in the United States economy. There was a net increase of 9.4 gig economy jobs. Implication, traditional jobs, as we know, instinctively and anecdotally, are decreasing as a share of the marketplace. The marketplace for labor is changing radically. So that's the only reason I want to show you that. Show you this, same data. Some of these industries, you'll notice the, the, the three time slots. Some of these industries, like construction, which is a tall one on this side, they've had contingent labor a lot. It's, it's, it's familiar. Anybody in construction is aware that there's contingent work. All the others, except the one, the, the, one, the one over there, which is professional service, most of the others, you can see, there's a radical increase in that yellow bar compared to the past. And right on the far side, government's in on the act. The government is turning its workforce into a gig workforce too, getting rid of full-time workers, hiring them back as contingent workers. So there is a radical change going on, and it's got to do with automation, because you can't do this if you don't have computerized information processing. It's information processing that's driving this. And which brings me to this. David Weil, 2014. He wrote a fabulous book. It's called The Fish and Workplace. I would recommend everybody read it except for it's about this thick and it's turgid. Okay? It's a masterpiece of research. I mean, it really, really is. I love him to death. I love him to death because 
I kind of think down this road myself. Shareholder value is changing the way business is run. I'm not criticizing it. It's a natural progression in the world. We've turned our workforce from being a resource of skills, a repository of skills, into a cost. And we manage that cost as aggressively we can in order to increase the return to capital. This took the world by storm in the 1980s, right around the same time that neoliberal economics took the world by storm. It was out of the same home, Hayek and Milton Friedman. Hayek and Milton Friedman, you know, in their dungeon trying to destroy the economy as best they can. In their world, of course, not doing that. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm being snarky. But he describes the workplace that is a consequence of this as being fissured, right? The, the old world in which we all, I suspect we all worked no longer exists. Anything you think you've got as experience of workplace is irrelevant. Sorry to say that, guys. You no longer understand the workplace, right? And he goes into great, great detail about it. The key is that if you can apply information processing technology well enough, you can really distinguish inside your business between core activities, peripheral activities. Peripheral activities, you junk. I'll describe it in a minute. But shareholder value is a P. I, I was at business school when this was all being talked about. So excited. See, scientific. We can go and apply this in the workplace. We can turn our, share, you know, our shareholders. We, if up until shareholder value swept through the business schools, it, a good class in business administration was about just that, administration. If you look at some of the classic books of the 1950s, business books, the word shareholder's not in them. It's not even in the index. They didn't think it was important. The, this was a significant revolution. And it, I, I, it's a techno, I regard it as a techno, it's an intellectual technological revolution that is playing out as we speak. One of the consequences is what Jacob Hacker referred to as the great risk shift. You, you take stuff that the corporation used to do on your behalf and you make it the responsibility of the worker. Sounds great. Individual responsibility. You can look for your own pension. You can look for your own health care. You can worry about your own vacation. It's individual responsibility. Who can argue with individual responsibility? It's such a wonderful term. But it's an assumption of risk by the worker. Now, if you're taught anything, you're taught the risk and return are supposed to move together. The whole trick here is that they don't move together. We give you risk. We keep the return. Okay? That's the trick we're playing. That's why we drive, are able to drive up shareholder value. Phil, don't, you're looking a little upset. I, won't, I don't mean to upset you, Phil. Okay? I don't mean to upset you. But that is precisely what happened. Look at the consequence. Profits versus wages. It worked. It's a miracle. I did this myself, Phil. Don't worry about it. <laughs> The, the, the seminal moment in that whole thing came here with Prahlad and Hamill in this, if any, I, this, 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 this paper on core companies, which came out in 1990, was the first thing I had an argument with my wife Valerie over. So she said, she said I didn't know what I was talking about. So there we are. The whole premise of this is that if you have the right technology to manage over your logistics and so on over great sweeps of territory, you can start shifting stuff out and only focus in the center on things that make value to the shareholder. IT is a classic example. That's a commodity. Everybody's got IT. I don't make profits by being an IT shop, an accounting shop or whatever. Get rid of it. That's why you saw outsourcing. That's why you saw globalization or offshoring. All of these things are a direct consequence of these ideas. And if you do that, all of a sudden you're not responsible for the, the wages. You're not responsible for the benefits. I can shove stuff off in China. They're paid Chinese wages and Chinese benefits, right? If I'm Apple, I can, when I'm talking to the media, I can say, ah, I'm responsible for 700,000 jobs worldwide. Aren't I good? Only 70,000 of them on my books. Getting 
American benefits and American wages. The rest, eh, I don't know, they're somewhere else, okay? So this had an enormous, enormous impact on the workplace. This is that same diagram viewed from the purpose, the, the, uh, somebody running a shop on, a, on that shareholder value slash core competency basis. I am paying a wage. I've reduced the cost of getting that work done. We're back to the end of work, guys. I've reduced the cost of getting that work down simply to the wage. I've got rid of all that extraneous stuff, right? I've managed to get rid of it. It's beautiful, wonderful. This is what it looks like from the contingent worker's point of view, however. I still need that stuff. And you're not paying me for it. I'm a miserable SOB. This is why so many people in the workplace today are unhappy. <laughs> this, the wage has not increased to compensate them for having to find their own health care, having to find their own re re retirement plans and so forth. Let alone, take, if you take time off and you're a contingent worker, that's coming out of your pocket. Right? That's two weeks, three weeks, a month that you're not getting money. So you've, this is what Hacker was talking about, the great risk shift. Radical shift in the way that workplace works. Wheel says it kind of this way, and, and I, I, I want to just stop because there's so much. Federal and state policies are based on a model of employment with a single, well-defined employer with direct responsibility in hiring, firing, managing, training, compensation, development of its workforce. Don't exist. That's why government policy sounds so hollow to a lot of people nowadays. Economic history runs in one direction. As much as we like aspects of the past, the age of the large corporation directly employing a very wide cross-section of the American workforce has passed. It's not coming back. Traditional jobs are dead. They're declining. So it's the Monty Python. If you hadn't nailed it, you know? So the thing it would be pushing up the daisies. Consequences. Inequal I'm not going to spend too much time. You know all about this. In inequality is rising. Why? Well, because we've bifurcated the economy. <laughs> I've, we've shoved a lot of people out. They're looking after themselves in the name of individual responsibility. Good for them. Wonderful. Meanwhile, I, in management, look like a hero to my shareholders, and they're paying me a ton load of money. Why, it's no accident that since shareholder value took off in the 1980s, CEO salaries have shot through the roof. And work, you know, in, in, as a multiple of um, worker salaries. And if you're a shareholder, good. You want that. It's wonderful. So this, the bottom chart just shows you how the middle class is hollowing out. Middle class itself was a function of industrialization. We won't have one shortly unless we take steps. Oh, hang on. Take steps. I thought this was interesting. Pew Research. Insecurity is unbelievable. People out there are working hard but feel bad. Working really hard, sometimes with two jobs and feeling bad. All right? And it shouldn't be that way in an affluent society, but it is. It's just a fact of our new circumstances. Look down that list. 44% of workers say they're having trouble making ends meet. Go down the list. I mean, it, all of these things are fairly self. I thought the one at the bottom about energy was just odd to me. I thought that was exaggerated, but you know, people are having a hard time. Meeting, they know there are people in their family being unemployed. There are people in their family who can't afford health care. These are not good economic times, despite the surface numbers that all look good, right? Underneath this, this churning going, and it is to do with this end of work. Look at this thing over here, this pie chart. Compensation is a wonderful term. Right? Because it includes a lot of other stuff, not just cash. For every $100 extra compensation that employers think they've paid out, what is it? My glasses are correct. 35% of it goes to health benefits. You don't see that in cash. 29% it goes to retirement benefits. You don't see that in cash. For every $100 of, that the employer says in that wonderful term, increased compensation this year, you're only getting $27, 20, just under $30. No wonder people are getting a little annoyed. It's like saying, you told me my income went up $100. It didn't. 
It really, really didn't. People feel insecure. I love this chart because it goes back to the Black Death, just to try to make you all feel really relevant. <laughs> this is really, really interesting. And God bless Greg Clark for collecting all this data. I mean, this is a <coughs> labor of love. One of the solutions we're told to our current malaise is that we need to get more skill in the workforce. Right? We keep hearing that. Eh, just, you know, every freaking article. Get more education. If only you were educated, we wouldn't have this problem. Well, I just want to point this out to you. See the Black Death? Wiped out 30% of the population. This is England. Wiped out 30% in like a very short amount of time, like three, four, five years. Devastating. Villages disappear. Now, you would have thought that would have increased the premium on skill. You know, the, the, the amount of money someone, a skilled person gets versus the amount of money an unskilled person. It had the exact opposite effect. Because coming out of the black death, everyone and his uncle said, I've got to get a skill because I can make an extra buck. All of a sudden, we have an oversupply of skilled people. And the premium drops. And it never goes back. This is, this is hundreds of years ago. And it never went back. All right? Then you have this quiet period, bouncing around a little bit. Then you have the Industrial Revolution, and it goes down again. Why? Because the Industrial Revolution put a premium on having unskilled labor. We de-skilled the workforce. We didn't want skilled workers. We wanted people who could do this reliably. Thank you very much. I don't need you to be able to tinker. Prior to industrialization, the, 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 most people were really good tinkering. Hands, you know, in the, in the, out in the village, the artisan type workforce. Got rid of that. We don't need it. We just need you to pull that damn lever regularly every few minutes, right? Or every few seconds if I speed the production line up, right? That put a premium on unskilled labor. So all of a sudden that comes up and the skill set rel uh, uh, premium drops again. It comes back, right? This, this is really because it's a long term. That little blip at the end is the post-World War II premium to getting a college education. And it's going. Again, if you've, read, if you've paid attention to the press, people are coming out with college degrees and working, you know, baristas and so on. There's no jobs anymore, or fewer jobs, I should say. And as I said, those jobs are going. Come on, guys, it's a marathon. I'm getting there. There's a hollowing out effect. Jobs are being created at both ends of the skill spectrum. High, unskilled, that's what this piece closest to me, increased jobs, far side, skilled jobs, computer engineers, stuff like that, their jobs are increasing. Anything that required middling skills, modest abilities, but that you train for, gone. That's why the middle class is disappearing. You're either going down or you're struggling to go up and artificial intelligence, as I said earlier, is about to do its work on the far, on the far side of that chart you're going to see more people coming this way than going that way. OK? All right. Phew. Inequality, de-skilling, insecurity, sound familiar? That's the workplace of today. That's the job market we have today. That's why when people write these articles about robots and the end of work, it's like, ah, I can't stand it. On top of what else is going on? You're kidding. There's going to be no jobs, <laughs> let alone bad jobs. <laughs> this is really, really bad. But it's a function, both automation and deconstruction of the workplace are a function of the same thing. Employers, businesses, logically trying to increase their return. This is a perfectly logical thing. Can't criticize it. Good capitalist thing. But it does tend to divide the world up. It's an epochal divide. It's out of control. I don't think we should sit here and think that the corporation of today will exist 50 years from now. Will the, I think the reorganization of the workforce is the next wave coming. We've re sorry, the, the, uh, the reorganization of business. We've reorganized the workforce as far as we can go. It's, it's in action. It's happening. Shell value is going up. The unrest that's going to come with that, and we saw a hint of it in 2016, the unhappiness that it's creating, Automation and deconstruction of the workplace are not pleasant events. The digital 
era is announcing its presence in a very nasty way. Our institutions, one of which is the job, a second of which is the large corporation, third of which is the government, things like unemployment insurance, they're all out of date. They're all going to go away. If I can do this, I can run a company from my phone. I can easily run a company. What a company is, under that new definition, I don't know. Right? None of us know. But we're going to get there. We're really going to get there. Because de digital technology, if, if there's one thing we should all bear in mind, a business firm is an information processor. It exists to move information around to do stuff. Information processing is the one thing that computers do really, really well. So business organization is going to go. Traditional jobs are going to go. How encouraging can I get? Well, I'm going to leave you with this. The digital revolution is an end to work. <laughs> it's a very ambiguous phrase, an end to work. Does it mean work? We're going to do no work? Who's going to do no work? Humans do no work? Are we back to the horse thing of Leontiev, right? Who's, somebody's going to do work. Is it just a machine? And if this is really the world we're in, how on earth are we going to survive as a society? You've got a few people making all the money and nobody else making none of the money. That's a recipe for revolution. And before we all say that, I'm exaggerating, I remind you of 1848. We've been through this before. We know how ugly it gets. We know the struggle that takes has to take place to rebalance the economy. Thank you. I hope you're a... Uh... No, are you going to ask the first? All right, come on, ask the first question. <laughs> no, are, are people going to go quietly? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. The, 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 this is where the you know, two different sets of logic collide. Right? We have a society, a social structure. If you look back, let's say the 50s and 60s, it was a wonderful time. It was quiet. We were in a very quiet time. Everything was in alignment. The, all the fighting over getting the benefits, creating the jobs, and so forth, was a thing of the past. So a generation or two came to, came, went into the workforce not knowing how difficult it was to go through a revolution. We're now going to go through a revolution. So people aren't going to go quietly. Think Trump. It's not happening. People are unhappy. People are really, really unhappy, despite the top surface numbers. Okay? If you look at the growth, it's okay. Unemployment's low. We should be good. No. No, because uh, you know, you've got enormous amounts of insecurity. Enormous amounts of insecurity. Not to mention inequality. It's not sustainable. It's not, I don't think it's sustainable, I should say. <clears throat> politically and uh, socially. It's not an economic problem. <laughs> We've solved the economic problem. <laughs> we, we can produce a lot of stuff cheaply. But, but that's not what we're really talking about. Yeah. Growth in human popul population? Well, two things. One is it adds to the glut of labor. We've got, a, too, man, we've got too much labor worldwide. Way too much labor. Uh, <clears throat> but the growth in the population is going to peak and decline because a lot of countries are getting more affluent. You're more tuned in this than I am. But as affluence increases, birth rates drop. So you can see a peak in population. Doesn't mean that we're not going to have a glut of labor. That glut of labor is going to cause a lot of problems. It is causing problems, I should say. It's driving down wages. It is creating migration. People moving from one place to another in the search of a good job. If you look at, you look at a lot of the big social and demographic trends, they're being caused by the world glut of cheap labor, looking for good wages. <laughs> but then when they arrive, they drive down wages. Right? So it's, it's a really difficult problem. But I don't think, getting back to your, I don't think at its core that adds or subtracts too much long term. <clears throat> the logical end of this if you, if you can create, let me put it this way, you can create an argument where capital becomes less important because I can create a business like this. It costs me a phone. How much, how much capital do I need for that? How much, seriously, look, look, at, look, at, look, at the, uh, look at some of our biggest market cap com companies. 
they don't use enormous amounts of capital in the old sense of capital, right? Uber, Uber, look at Uber. I mean, it's half a dozen people in a back room or whatever it is. I mean, it's more than that. But it, 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 it's, it's a big company, splashy, big market valuation, minimal capital. Look at, you know, right? Now, counter argument, Amazon, they are now expanding their capital footprint. Right? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, you, as I say, you can argue this both ways. The, where we are is a logical result. Well, it's the picture I was trying to paint, it's a logical result of two or three hundred years of working out the return to capital problem. It's not a, this is not an American problem. The world is facing this problem. This is not an American problem. There, there, there are different points in the development of the problem. The Western world is closer to the, or further along in the development of the problem. China is going to have this problem, let's say, 50 years from now, speculatively. All right? They're going to have it in spades because they've got an enormous population. What are you going to do with it when you've displaced it all? I mean, it's, it's an astonishing problem. That's my point about turbulence. I think, I think we're entering a period where we need to have a discussion about, not about stopping AI or stopping automation and so forth, because those things are what creates wealth. That's the wealth generation of capitalism, which we all applaud. Right? It's how we distribute that wealth is where the argument's going to be. It was where the argument was in the first Industrial Revolution. It was where the argument was in the second Industrial Revolution. And, it, it, and as I said, it, it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And you, I would imagine that in the next 40 years are going to be really interesting if you're a political scientist or a sociologist or something. There's going to be lots of upsets. Could be one or two revolutions. Democracy will topple in one or two Western countries. And you will, find, you will find enormous struggle over who gets this. Because it's great stuff that's being produced. It's just not being shared at the moment. And, 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 and let me finish. And as I said, think of the 2016 presidential election, which I think is just the beginning. Just the beginning. I don't think it's the end at all. It's just the beginning. You've got a lot of unhappy people out there. And they're not you know, cr crazy industrial Luddites burning down factories. They think they're playing the game right. If a political system is not sufficiently adept at changing its institutional structure to, to recognize this new reality that, don't forget, this new reality is being created by the private sector. All right? Good for them. Wonderful. That's kind of what we expect. What's not going on is taking a look at all of the industrial era social stuff and making it modern in the context. Like, and I, like the classic example, we've just gone through it, healthcare. Portable healthcare. So that you don't have to get a job to get healthcare. That means all these gig workers can go off and create. We're, 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 we're actually dampening productivity by forcing people to stay in a job to keep healthcare. If they could go off and get a job, they could be entrepreneurial and we could increase productivity. So it's discussions like that. But in that context, the, you may have read the, 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 this idea of um, uh, guaranteed income. Uh, I would imagine that that's going to get a lot of attra attraction. Whether it comes into being, I don't know. That's the fight, <laughs> right? But I think that it, it comes back a little bit to what I said with the apocryphal Henry Ford thing. It's no god good having the world's most productive economy if there's nobody can afford to buy anything. You need demand on the other side of this equation. I mean, you really need, you've got to sell this stuff. Otherwise, it just piles up in Amazon warehouses. There's no point to it, right? So somewhere there has to be a balance. And I, right now, because we're going through a change, we're out of balance. What we do need to do is to recognize that we're out of balance and then start having a conversation about how we get back into balance. All right. I, I think I, I, this is not about destroying capitalism. It's simply about getting back into balance, kind of where we were 50 years ago. Because don't forget, that was an exceptional, quiet, tranquil period. And we would love to get to another exceptional, quiet, tranquil period. But I'm saying it's probably not in our lifetimes, may not be in our children's lifetimes. It, it's, it, it could take that long to have this conversation. Look at, look at the political polarization. 
When you're when you going through this kind of a change, people dig in, <laughs> really dig in. It takes a lot to shift the needle. So that means it's a long conversation, not a short conversation. And frankly, none of our politicians are really having the conversation. Right. Now, and that's the hard point right now. I, they're, they're still, if you look, if you look at, that's why I, I, I was just not a Clinton supporter. Why? Because she's talking about the 1980s and the 1990s. You know, she's talking about the world as it was and thinking it's still here. It's gone. It's already gone. This is not a question of trying to slow it down. It's gone. Government institutions, pol political systems, but also the institutions that those systems have put in place to deal with the workplace and to deal with work and jobs. It's an enormous amount of effort. I mean, I, can you imagine Wilbur Ross really saying we need to rewrite the unemployment law? I mean, can you do that? I mean, it's not going to happen. It, it, people like that have to move on and we need a new generation arriving. I think, I think the glimmer of hope is in the generational shift. I think young people are understand. They're living in this world. Don't forget, they are. They're entering the workplace knowing they're not going to have a permanent job, knowing that they're going to be kind of shifting around all over the place, knowing that they're not going to have benefits, knowing that they're not going to have a. Uh, uh, they're going to have your issue, Ralph, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. They're going to have a hard time getting experience and training. So they're they're looking for ways to accomplish all of that, and you start seeing it. I mean, I think you're going to start seeing new institutions form themselves. Just as, as if you go back to the 1800s, the rise of unions was a response to the workplace. It was a rotten workplace. Unions came. Goodness knows how much turmoil, social turmoil took place. Everybody fought themselves to a happy medium. We got rid of child labor. Uh, a lot of the obnoxious work conditions were reduced and so on and so on and so on. We are going to have to go through an analogous process. And before you can go through that process, you need groups in society gunning to get there. All right? I think you're going to see that from the uh, young generation of people. I think they're, 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 they're living it. So they, they, that's why they close their ears a lot of the time to politicians. It's like you're, t you're not talking about my life. You're not talking about my life as I'm experiencing it, all right? So they are going. No, 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 no. Because they're making it work. They're hacking around, and don't forget, they're living off their parents. They've got the baby boom made a lot of money for themselves, creating this mess, and now they're able. You know, they're they're, they're passing it along, right? And don't forget, uh, uh, any sensible millennial with a, a a parent with a nice home and goodness knows, sitting there waiting for it to, you know, excuse me, could you pass on because I need the inheritance. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you're going to get a massive intergenerational transfer of wealth, during which, I suspect, you may have a conversation about how to deal with this. But no, the answer is, my optimism is that automation itself is not going to be a problem. It's the, it, it's the way in which it manifests itself in the business workplace that is the problem. That's where the social tension comes from. If you look from a purely academic economics point of view, we've gone through this. We're going to create more wealth. It's going to be great. How we divide it up, that's the politics and where the, 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 the argument comes from. In theory, it is passed on in lower prices. All right? So that is, if you look, in a, if you look, at, um, you look at Henry Ford, Henry Ford back 1908, 450 employees, 10,000 cars a year. 1920, don't know how many employees, but he's producing uh, uh, 2 million cars a year because of phenomenal productivity increase. The car was 80% cheaper. The car, so a lot of people could afford cars. That, and, and not only that, but he was very enlightened. He increased wages so they could buy the cars, right? Yeah. We, we're not, it's that enlightenment we're not getting. Uh, it's that enlightenment we're not getting because shareholder value actually gets in the way. If I'm, if I'm a, a big corporation, I'm going to give my employees a 20% pay increase so they can buy my product? I'd get fired tomorrow. I'd get fired tomorrow. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. So it's, that's, part of the, that's part of Steve's conversation. We need to get business itself to realize that this is not a sustainable trajectory for them. And Consumers do need to see some benefit, but workers need to see benefit. Consumers, workers, same thing. I am, I'm kind of in the camp where a lot of that stuff is inevitable. 
It's inevitable. And the reason it's inevitable, because if you've broken up the workplace this way, and you've taken away from an increasing number of people things like healthcare benefits, they're going to want it. They are a, a, one of the most appreciative groups of Obamacare was gig workers. They loved it. They really loved it. Don't take it away from them, because you're going to really muck up the workplace if you do. And that we've got. I, I want to try to. We need to engage our Republican and Democratic friends in understanding that they both have the same problem. Right? It, it, this is a reality as it exists. What is a solution to the reality as it exists? Let's not go back in time. Let's not fight over whether socialized medicine is good or bad. It may be the only solution. The, the two entrenched points of view are not having a conversation about the reality. The reality is people need health care, right? Health care costs are one of the largest uh, causes of financial insecurity. They're one of the largest causes of personal bankruptcy, right? They're an incredibly difficult thing for a large number and an increasing number of people. Enlightened politics, either side of the aisle, we need a solution to this that is not simply, oh, you're responsible for yourself. I'm already responsible for myself, and I don't like it, thank you, OK? <laughs> so that's not an answer. I, I think, but I don't want us to get into that. I mean, I think retirement is the same thing. The shift from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans, I didn't mention that, driven by the need to get shareholder value, right? And it's been a disaster for retirees. It's a disastrous policy. 401k has proven to be one of the worst public policies we've had in 50 years or so. And yet, <laughs> there it is, it's still the state of the art, and we're, and we're still having discussions in Congress about things like HSAs and stuff like that, which take money to, it, it's great tax deduction for the wealthy. Does it mean anything to anybody who's a gig economy who doesn't have an income to start with? I can't take a tax deduction, thank you very much. I got no income. <laughs> I got no income, it's meaningless to me. Don't even talk to me about it. Yeah. You've all heard me, <clears throat> Mention, I'm sure, the Gillenson Page study on 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 uh, what what the legislation who it benefits. For those of you who don't know, I'm sorry, I'm going to bore you all again. Gillenson Page wrote this long study, 2014, I think. They took all the legislation back to 1980 and they stacked it up who benefits who, who from from the legislation. <clears throat> there were 18, I built round numbers, 1,800 laws they looked at. Something in the order of 90% benefited big business. And the last, the last, the last, and that's money in politics, pure and simple, money in politics. Come on, I was down there writing legislation for the banking industry. I know, what this, I know this, how this game works. Um, the, the, uh, their last paragraph in that paper, uh, paper was very sobering. It says, if you believe that in a democracy, the majority, not all, but the majority of legislation, benefits the majority, but not all, of the population. The United States is no longer a democracy. And, and, and it's kind of, it kind of sobering when you see two guys who are fairly conservative academics. These guys aren't raving, but their research is rock solid. Is there anything out there? No, we've kind of got to go through this a bit so that there's more percolation of ideas. You look at a lot of that research I was looking at, uh, quoting, it's 2015, 2016, 2017. That's academic stuff. It takes a while to find its way into the political parties uh, and, and to be embraced and people to make it into policy. It's, it's a really difficult thing. And I was, uh, you know, I've been, in, I've been involved. I mean, I, I reached out to Wilbur Ross and said, hey, we need to have a chat about the future of the workplace. Crickets, right? And I don't blame him. He's got other priorities. And coming back to the, another question over, uh, over here, what's going to make it happen? I think it's, you know, we're going to go sideways for a long time. That's why I, 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 listen, you thought 2016 election was kind of wacky. Wait for 2020, wait for 2024. I think we're going to have to go through this and go through this and go through this till not just the politicians, but we are able to have that conversation. There's no, I don't think there is. And the funny thing is I'm not even opposed to shareholder value as long as we tax the hell out of the shareholders. Well, that's, that's <laughs> really and, and if there was one moment in history where this really turned, it was the really dr rapid drop in the top rates of income tax um, back in the 1980s. That's, that's, where, that's where set, 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 that set this whole thing in motion. 
And you've heard people like Bill Gates talk about, we should tax the robots. Rubbish. <laughs> tax the shareholders. And get, get rid of differential taxation, beneficial taxation for capital. Why should they be paying a lower tax rate than, than workers? Right? That's nonsense. Income, there's a, there's a famous uh, legal case in England where the, 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 law, the tax judge, the law judge, uh, was dis dis deciding a case on income. Sh was something eligible for income tax? And he, yeah, I can see him with his wig, he, he opined, income is income is income. You shouldn't distinguish between them. And we have in this false idea that somehow we encourage investment, which encourage whatever. A lot of us, we get a little sick, queasy in our stomachs when we hear millennials talk about they want experience. That's exactly what they're talking about. They, you know, they want, they want to enjoy this world. And they're going to enjoy this world. They, they, they love the idea. We did a survey, my wife and I did a survey. This is a research, private research we did. They, if you ask workers, gig workers, now, they say, I love the independence. I love the lack of office politics. I love, I love that. It's wonderful. They love a lot of it. They don't like the, the idea that they're financially insecure. They don't like the idea that they um, don't get unemployment insurance. <laughs> I, I thought of starting a private uninsurance company as a result. Uh, and, and they hate the idea of health insurance. They, it's, they hate it. You know, give, me, give it to me. It's a right. And, and then I'm happy. You can, I can wander around in this gig economy because then I can take six months off. I'll go to Peru. I'll come back and another gig. I can, that's my life. In their world, there is no such thing as retirement. They've brought retirement and integrated it into their current lives. They don't expect to retire. Okay? So they're quite happy if they can figure it out and they are busy figuring it out to do just that. All right, guys, thank you. <laughs>